Welcome back to the Mouth Basketball Hawks Nest Podcast. On tonight's show, we're looking back at the Hawks split against Niagara last weekend. Looking ahead to this week's ESPN matchup against Manhattan and taking a look at what's going on around the rest of the MAC. As always, we have Mark on with us and a special guest tonight. We're fortunate to be joined again by Jaden Daly. This guy covers the MAC like nobody else. College basketball analyst Jaden Daly. What's going on, Jaden? Ryan, thank you for the great introduction, and I, I appreciate the kind words always. It's been a while since I've been able to come on with you guys, so thank you for the opportunity. Always love coming on with you, too. What's up, Mark? Yeah, I'm going to take the back seat as the color guy tonight, and we're going to let Jaden Daly shine like no one else shines when they're talking Mac groups. So, Jaden, now that you can't really travel around as much because the arenas aren't open for fans, um, you cover basketball all around the Northeast, especially New York City area. So how are you doing your reporting? Like, do you have, like, double screens going in your house, iPads, two games at 7, two games at 9, check out, you know, St. Mary's at 11? Like, how are you doing this, writing about these teams and keeping up while well, you can't be there in person? I'm sure it's killing you not going to these stadiums. It, it's it's killing me, Ryan, but it's saving me money. So that's, true, that's, always, true. that's always a plus. And you, you guys know I take the train all over the place, so – that that's saving me so much money and I've actually embraced it more than I thought I would this season. I'll tell you, I thought it would be a, a worse experience than going into an empty gym, but that that's sterile enough as it is. And you just got to make it work for you. And fortunately I've been able to do that. Yes. Yeah, sometimes I do have two screens. Sometimes I have one game on the TV and the other game on my phone. Like that's, that's one thing that I've been able to do. I, I've covered both Buffalo schools at home this year, which I would normally never be able to do under usual circumstances. So that works out for me in in a sense. And honestly, I've spent more time covering Monmouth than just than probably any other team this season. Maybe Rutgers and Seton Hall, but I've covered more Monmouth this year than any point since Justin was still there. We like to hear that. I mean, I'm used to doing, uh, you know, the Bachelor or, you know, the challenge on MTV on one screen and with Nicole and I got, you know, a mom on one screen and a football game on the other screen. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to doing two or three screens, screens at a time too. So that's definitely uh, nothing new for me either. Um, so going over the mom, the first win of the weekend, they split up at Niagara game one and game two were pretty much opposite images of each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, took the first one, 77, 67 at Niagara. And we know how tough it is to sweep up there. So Mark and I spoke about this before, kind of this big road trip that Monmouth has, even though it's been split up by COVID and rescheduling and craziness. Um, if you can at least, you know, go four and two or, you know, three-ish, three and three-ish on the split um, on a trip like that, you'll take it. You want to be above 500, but it's tough to sweep these series. And mom has been so good at home, you can kind of afford to lose one here and there. So again, It's very rare that when you did the Buffalo trip with Tanisha and Niagara, that anybody except maybe Iona and their prime was getting a sweep. So I'm not worried about the trip this weekend. So the first one wound up great for Monmouth. The offense was humming earlier in the game. Uh, Malik Pappas, Totley, and Dion were on fire to start the game, starting out with a 26-12 lead. And Monmouth's defense was really the story here. They played probably their best defensive half of the season in this one and every player on the floor was locked in. I mean, they were getting steals and blocks and they were doing everything out there and causing havoc for Niagara's offense. Um, Malik heated up in the second half at eight points in a six minute stretch. A couple of threes at the end of the half. Ruddy was an absolute monster in the second half. Uh, We've been talking about Nikkei Ruddy a lot. We know what he can bring to the team. We know that he's a very important piece as a junior this year. Um, especially with guys graduating the last couple of years, the big guy spot. Um, but Nikkei was a monster. And it's the first time we've seen that from him really take over a game. And he sure did in the second half. Um, I think he had 12 points in this one. I'll get into the stats a little bit later. But it was a great game for Nikkei. Um, just being able to see him dunk the ball through the basket a few times and just show some confidence out there. Um, what do you guys think about how uh, – I know you didn't watch the game particularly, but – how do you feel about Nikkei finally having that big breakout game? Well, Ryan, that was actually the one game I did see. I, I covered the I covered the Friday game. It was the Saturday game I didn't see, and I was very impressed with what Nikkei Ruddy was able to do in the second half. Had a couple of dunks early on, 
and really supplemented Malik Martin in the first half. Team Rice needs that. Monmouth has had success with the smaller lineup with Marcus at the four and Malik at the five. But when you can get Nike and when Jarvis Vaughn comes back, you can get him and Miles Foster going alongside those two. Your front line becomes just so much deeper and so much more competitive with some of the the bigger front courts in the MAC. Monmouth needed a game like that from Nike Ruddy, who's been up and down since coming back from his injury earlier in the offseason. And King said he was at 90% during the St. Peter's weekend. So any kind of progress is always good progress, especially halfway through the year with still another eight more games left to be played before the MAC tournament. You got to take what you can get. And I, I was very impressed with what Nike brought to the table in the second half. No doubt. All right. Um, so Monmouth led by 15 for most of the second half. Really didn't get that close. Uh, Niagara cut it down like 73-65, like an eight-point deficit kind of late in the half. Um, but, you know, totally hit some shots. McClary hit free throws. Um, they got the job done at the line to close this game out. Um, it was just a great team win, very efficient shooting the ball. Um, you know, they, they play as well as they had in this game as any other game so far. It was a great one to see. Malik Martin, again – I said it in the beginning of the season after the first couple games, Malik Martin has a real chance this year to be Mac all third team. Maybe I'm even saying there's an argument for him right now that he could even work his way up to the second team. If he keeps playing the way he is 19 points, six rebounds, five assists, eight of 12 shooting three of five from three. Malik Martin is having a hell of a senior year to start out. And we'll talk about him more a little bit later. I'll give you guys a chance after I go through these stats. Um, Dion had a solid night, 18 points. Getting very close to breaking Dave Calloway's all-time record for threes at Monmouth. Uh, Pappas had 10 points, most of them on free throws. Again, teams are making a very concerted effort with him, locking him up behind the three-point line. But he has been efficient when he gets his shots. We just got to figure out how to get him more open shots. And we'll talk about how that gets done later. Um, they bottled up Miles Ruth a little bit, but still had a solid night for him. Did a bunch of stuff on defense. Um, McClary, same thing. Didn't really score the ball much, but great on defense all night. Um, you know, Nikkei Ruddy, six boards, two steals, 12 points, five of six shooting. That's real, real, we, really where it came with Ruddy was the efficiency because we've seen him miss some bunnies this year, some easy inside shots, layups, dunks, and he really was just so efficient in this game. Um, you know, Chapu, you know, didn't score a lot this weekend, but play is starting to kind of play his role better as the backup point guard, the distributor. Um, totally had nine points in this one. And a few guys didn't play, which is kind of surprising. Jarvis, Luga, Holmstrom, and Foster all were, do not did not play. Um, but I want to get back to Malik for a second. I mean, he had his best or second best game of the year. And, you know, Jaden, you see how these all-MAC teams work, you know, for a long time now. Mm-hmm. Where would you put uh, Malik Martin right now? What do you kind of think his ceiling is based on what you're seeing around the Mac? He's been unbelievable. He could be, he could be Ryan, a second team player, depending on how he finishes the season. Seniors usually get a bit of a boost in the voting as almost like a lifetime achievement award. And we, we've seen guys like Rob Poole at Siena in the past, Shane Richards at Manhattan get moved up maybe to a, a spot where you might not think they would be just based on how they are on paper. But second, third team is probably right around the expectation for Malik. Obviously you're going to look at Dion Hammond and you're going to think Dion will be a first teamer. George might, George Pappas might be a second team player. It's going to come down to George and Malik and who's, who means more. And you can make a case for either one of them in different ways. George being a clutch outside shooter and, and Malik doing a little bit of everything. I was fortunate enough to be able to write a feature on him a couple of weeks ago. And then right before I do that, Monmouth and Manhattan get sidelined for the weekend. And I have to promote it for another few days. Not a bad thing there. But you, you look at George and Malik, and they're really pretty much interchangeable as 2A and 2B behind Dion. It'll go to who probably leaves the stronger impression at the end of the year. Mark, thoughts there? So uh, kudos to Malik Martin uh, at low underscore madness actually gave him their Mac player of the week uh, for the weekend over the weekend average 17 points and eight rebounds Uh, kid has been stroking it from three lately. I feel like he's their most important player on the defensive end, his versatility from guarding everyone from threes to fives and the way that the ball can move and swing when he's playing that five 
It's it's unbelievable what he's doing at six six. And we always go back to he was a late signee. Red Nicholas was involved with uh, his AAU program and kind of pushed him on King. He was seventeen years old when he showed up on Mama's campus. Didn't turn eighteen until later on in his freshman year, and just the the sequential growth from freshman to sophomore to junior to now senior year. And, and Ryan and I had kind of said in the preseason, he was that one guy we thought could really take a big step forward as Mammoth went away from the pack line last year and into more of a scramble uh, trap defense where Malik was getting steals. He was getting deflections. He was getting out on the break. It just seemed like that shift really ignited him. And he's just taken where he was at the end of last year, which I think in the last five regular season games, he had three and double figures. He's taken that and just brought it to another level this year. And uh, in a year where we saw, we've seen Ruddy uh, come back and struggle some to get healthy and get his footing. He actually ended up missing the Saturday game after his breakout performance in the Friday game. And we've seen uh, Jarvis deal with injuries and some inconsistency. And then two freshman bigs, six foot six Malik Martin, has taken the challenge and been the man at the five for Mammoth and uh, Mammoth fans are just so thankful for what they've seen from him. And kudos to Jaden who put that uh, that that article out on Malik right before he really took off. So you know what that that's expert journalism. If you want to find a guy who's out ahead of it, that's Jaden Daly. <laughs> You're too kind, Mark. So in this one, um, it, it really came down to shooting efficiency. I mean, both teams only had nine turnovers each. It was a pretty clean game, uh, about even on the boards. But Mama shot at 50 percent. Niagara shot at 41 percent. Mama was 47 percent from three. Niagara was 27 percent. It, it's really all came down to both teams took care of the ball. Mama just shot a lot better on Friday night. And, you know, Nwandu had 20 points for them. Um, I'm probably going to butcher this, but Kwakatsenza had – um, 10 points. Quack and Mensa, close enough. Quack and Mensa. All right, I'll take that. I'm a letter off, not bad. Um, <laughs> but he had 10 points and fouled out kind of early. Um, but uh, Mount made a strong effort to mark to lock down Marcus Hammond, and he had six points in the night, three of 15 shooting. Very uncharacteristic for Hammond, but you know, Mount made a very big effort about that. And Kane mentioned it in the press conference where he explained that they put some, they threw some different things in Niagara on purpose that they hadn't thrown at them before, especially under Greg Paulus. So they weren't prepared for that. And they made sure, you know, Marcus Hanna is not going to beat me. And King mentioned it. He's a guy that he recruited very heavily, but he made some mistakes. And again, anybody can speculate on what they were. We've talked a lot about recruiting on this podcast over the past of things we like, things we didn't like, but you know, we have all kinds of theories on that, but he did explain how he made mistakes in the recruiting process and he should have had Marcus Hammond and Ray Salonay, who were good friends in high school, together Jeez. at Mammoth. So he's kind of the one that got away. Um, but overall, they they locked him down, and Niagara really didn't have much of an answer there. Um, so, you know, I know you got a few marks no, uh, notes, Mark, on uh, Niagara here. Yeah. Uh, so what they had done was on Friday, they were doubling Hammond off the ball screens and kind of making someone else beat you. Very Steve Masiello-esque, actually, in a, in a, in a blueprint for uh, stopping the opposing superstar. But um, when we're talking about Marcus Hammond, for me, there have been three Cardozo guys that I really wish we had at Monmouth. And number one was Ray Salnave. Number two was Tariq Coborn after, um, after he had had his transfer from St. Bonaventure. We saw him this year with Ofstra. He looks like a stud. I mean, I think he's a first-team all CAA guy. And then number three was Marcus Hammond. Now I wasn't out in front of Marcus Hammond's recruiting during his high school days. So I can't say that, you know, I was beating that drum that mama should have taken him, but I loved this game from the first time I saw him suit up for the purple Eagles. As then he was a baby faced assassin from three at just 18 years old with an underdeveloped body uh, throughout coaching changes. He still has steadily improved and filled out his body. And now is definitely among the best five players in the Mac, maybe among the best three players in the Mac. And rumor has it that he actually wanted to come to Monmouth badly. And this seems to be truly a recruiting miss for King Rice and company. Jaden, last thoughts before we move on to game two. Well, King Rice did mention that Marcus Hammond and Ray Sally of the two teammates at Cardozo were close. I 
would love to picture Marcus in that backcourt, but then at the same time, it would become too crowded, and then you wonder, the, where where is there a place for a guy like George Pappas or for Samuel Shep, who Do, does Dion's possession time and usage decrease? And do you, do you get more balanced stats in the backcourt? So it's, it's always going to be a what if in recruiting, but that that's an interesting picture. And then Mark, I know how you feel about Coburn. Jeez. <laughs> Imagine him in this lineup. I mean, yeah, he would have just be, he would be the four man and Marcus McClary be the six man. And, uh, nothing, you know, nothing against Marcus McClary. It was, it was great for Monmouth, but Coburn is just, he's, he's an offensive talent beyond what Monmouth has in the front court, even beyond what Malik Martin is. And that, that's really saying a lot. So yeah, would have loved them all. You know what you want to have, you want to have everybody, but, um, push come to shove. Most times King Rice and company get it right with who they bring in here and they develop guys. And, you know, we have to, we have to have confidence and, we're happy with the 13, 14, 15 guys we have on our roster. And while, while we're on the topic of Kobe Nwandu, is it me or does he have a little bit, albeit of, of a smaller build, more of an Emmy Andahar, David Lowry type floor game in terms of scoring and, and rebounding too? What do you see in that? So that's interesting. I thought you were going to go Deion Jones, which I kind of uh, saw a little bit of Deion Jones with the versatility from the outside and the rebounding and the, and the toughness. And I, I had this queued up for later, but uh, Ryan, I'm just going to jump into it real quick Go for on, it. on the Wandu with an interesting wrinkle on him. He was a D two player mm-hmm. with former Niagara coach. I guess we can call him a former Niagara coach, Pat Beeline at LeMoyne mm-hmm. and has transitioned to the D one level seamlessly and taking these D two up transfers at the low mid major D one level is going to become a bit more um, important now as the NCAA seems to be going towards all transfers being immediately eligible. And you would assume that the Power 5, Power 6s will be taking all uh, many of the low and mid superstars. So maybe this is a way that teams at the MAC level can stay relevant when they lose a Rich Kelly a Ray Salnave, um, you know, who, whoever it might be, um, all those guys, the guy at Ryder, Demencio Vaughn. What do you uh-huh. think about that, Jaden? About uh, at the level of the MAC, utilizing maybe um, a D2 player who's a stud at D2 that someone has already developed for one or two years with this immediate eligibility transfer rule to try to utilize it to benefit you where we know already that it's going to hurt us with the, the big boys taking our superstars um, sometimes. Maybe not always, but sometimes. Absolutely. It, it can only help. And you see it at the Juco level, too, in mid-majors. But you look at Division two transfers, and it even works at a high major level. You look at what Matt Struess did at DePaul for two years. He was a Division two transfer for Dave Lato, and he, he ended up being second-team All-Big East and really carved up St. John's a couple of years ago. So... If you can play, and then even better than that, Division Three, Duncan Robinson, Duncan before Robinson, John yeah. Beeline went to Michigan, got him to Michigan, and he ended up in the NBA. His coach in Division Three, and you'll remember this name, was Mike Baker, the former head coach yep. of Marist. Mm-hmm. So I actually went down the rabbit hole while you guys were talking for a minute. Uh, I, I was talking about recruiting. I was thinking about somebody we lost in the offseason, and I looked up Darnell Brody. And decided to, oh. you know, metaphorically kick myself in the groin because what's he doing at Drake? Uh, what is he doing at Drake? He is starting every game, averaging 21 minutes a game and averaging 7.7 boards for an undefeated 17 and 0 ranked Drake team. So wow. that's what the, uh, the other night he had 14 rebounds. That's what barely we played at Seton Hall. We love our guys, but that is what we missed out on. So I decided to just, you know, kick myself in the groin for a minute there and make it hurt worse. Yeah, but, and, um, and he's a he's a guy Mammoth <laughs> missed out on twice. They had him on campus before he blew up when he was a junior in high school that summer. There was a picture of him on the uh, the the West Long Branch uh, boardwalk, um, and 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 they had had him on. And then unfortunately, as things happen and players blow up in their junior senior years in high school. Uh, the levels of offers came, and of course he went for the power offer. And then, you know what? Looking back now, 
Um, you, you can't really blame him for going to Drake with the special group they have nope. there. Also led by former Siena point guard Roman Penn, who's mm-hmm. having a heck of a year there as well. Um, it seems like they play a lot of guys. They're interchangeable. They play very unselfish basketball. I've, I've seen them play about two times this year, and he's just part of a really special group. But if you think about if you had had him with this Mammoth crew as a six foot nine wide body rebounder, um, space eater inside, he could have been the missing piece from being one of the four teams to being the one of the four teams in the MAC. So I'm going to run through this game a little bit quicker because I'd rather not talk about it as much. It was a tough game. <laughs> um, it's pretty much a reversal of the day before. Um, Niagara was the hungrier team, and they were motivated on their home floor, and it showed from the opening tip. Um, they had a look in their eyes. As soon as you turn on the TV and you just had a feeling this might be Niagara's night to kind of get revenge on us. Uh, you know, Dion got into foul trouble kind of early. Ruddy was held out. It seemed in the press conference King mentioned it wasn't his choice, but the training staff held him out. It seemed that way. Um, but either way, those two things definitely hurt us. Um, Nwandu was hot again. Got Niagara off to a 14-5 to lead to start the game. Monmouth cut it down 28-22. But, yeah, Monmouth played pretty sloppy in this one. And Niagara did that to them. It wasn't all self-enforced. Um, but, honestly, you know, Malik wasn't himself in this game. God was kind of out of control. Um, you know, it, it just wasn't their night. And, you know, we cut it down a few times. You know, we got it to a three-point lead, just a three-point deficit just before the half. Um, but we were down by about eight at the half. And at that point, it was kind of like, all right, we got a shot here, but you're not really feeling great about it. There's some scuffles at the end of the half, some words said back and forth, double tees. Um, not really sure who said what, but in the end, you know, King Rice lost his mind because – he didn't think our guys were in the wrong, which is pretty common. Um, but, you know, in the end, <laughs> double T's, we move on. Um, but it was the same story, kind of. And, you know, we would get a couple of baskets. Niagara would answer right back. We'd get it down to four points. Niagara extended to ten points. Like, we, we just couldn't get a feel on this game. And just when we started to come back a little bit, Cintron took over the game. I mean, mm-hmm. that dude was scoring left and right. You couldn't stop him. And he led Niagara to a 71-52 lead. 19 points was the highest it got. And honestly, you couldn't stop the guy. And in the end, Mama just didn't have what it took that night. And they played a much more aggressive, motivated team after the night before. They, get, they took a beating. Um, you know, totally had a pretty nice night. 17 points in 21 minutes. Definitely a nice night for him. Um, Malik wound up stuffing the stat sheet again. He had 14 points, 11 boards. But he did have four turnovers and did kind of look a little erratic in this game. Wasn't completely himself. But also, you got an eight-hour bus ride. You got back-to-back games. You can't blame these guys for getting tired or not having their best night two nights in a row. It's going to happen. But even being said that, you know, last year saying Malik had 14 points, 11 rebounds, that's a career night. This year, it's like, oh, well, he had 19 the day before, and he looked great. So, I mean, it's not a knock on Malik. You know, none of these guys looked the way they did the night before. Uh, Pap said 12 points. Dion only had nine in this one. Uh, Gob had moments where he looked great in this one and moments where he looked lost. So it was kind of a, you know, Jack on high thing for Gob in this game. Um, and Chaput didn't score, but – you know, he was good from the free throw line. He had five assists. Um, he's doing a better job filling his role as the distributor and not looking to score all the time. Um, we do hope, you know, he looks to score a little more often and has a little more control over the ball. But in the end, um, you know, this team just didn't play a great game. And their guys kind of went off a little bit. Cintron had 22 points in this one. I mean, that's not a guy that typically scores 20 points for them. So, you know, he had a big – actually, he hadn't missed a shot until the last seconds of the game. He was eight for eight from the field and six of six from the free throw line and he missed his last foul shot. He almost had a perfect game. Um, and, and the numbers speak for themselves. Mama had 15 turnovers. Um, they only shot 40% from the field. They just, they didn't get it done. And, you know, King talked about it in the press conference a little bit. Um, you know, they ran to a better team. And it's kind of like where we used to look at Iona or even in the NEC days, LIU and Wagner, when they had really good teams over there you're really excited to beat those top perennial teams because you haven't done it yet. And, you know, right now, Mama's kind of on top a little bit with Siena and Iona and Niagara, you know, King said we're seeing teams kind of be a little extra on the court and a little too, too excited when they beat us. 
but their kids having fun, and that means our our program's in a great place. So you know, he kind of laughed it off a little bit, but you did see the Niagara guys were losing their mind. Like this was like a final four semifinal game. Um, but you know what? It does mean our program's in a good, in a good place, and we've been there before. We've been in their shoes in the past, so you know, kudos to them for the getting the win. And you know, it is what it is. It's it's not a reason to panic. We're eight and four. We have plenty of games left versus teams that aren't that great. We have Fairfield. We have Ryder. Um, and hopefully you get at least a split against Iona and Manhattan. Um, but there's plenty of games within the schedule to win. Eight and four is no reason to panic. You know, if you lose to Manhattan, both on the road, eight and six, yeah, I start getting a little worried. But you know what? It's not a reason to worry about this game. They played a tough team. Niagara's not a bad team. Um, but overall, you know, they, they, they split. That's kind of usually what you want to do when you go to Buffalo. So, um, Jaden, I'll, I'll let you get the first one on this one. Absolutely, Ryan, and I wouldn't be too close to the ledge either with, with losses because now you're looking at a scenario where not every team is going to play the full max schedule. So if that comes into play, losses and winning percentage don't matter. The tournament field is going to be seeded and the standings are going to be set by conference wins. So it's not going to matter if Monmouth is, let's say, 12-6 and six and misses two games and Siena is 11-3, and three, for instance, and doesn't get to play the rest of its match schedule. Monmouth being a 12-win team in that hypothetical versus an 11-win Siena outfit would be the one seed, and if the NIT gets played, would have the NIT auto bid. That's still up in the air. Rich Enzer actually told me that nothing is etched in stone yet as far as the NIT auto qualifier, but it's looking like the MAC tournament will be set by conference wins in the standings, which hurts Iona being three and one right sure. now because, and Canisius at three and three, because neither of them have really got to play as many games as some other schools in the conference, but it could be a lucky break for a team like Monmouth, who as long as it stays ahead of Siena is in an advantageous position, especially if Marist keeps winning, because remember Monmouth swept Marist and Siena split with them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, feedback from me on this game. There's a couple things. One thing was very interesting on the broadcast. They had said that George Pappas over the last couple of years is shooting 25% from three against Niagara versus a much higher percentage from three uh, versus everyone else. So Niagara seems to defend him extremely well. Um, one cause for concern for me from this game, Dion Hammond again looking a little flat on the second day of a back-to-back after he uh, played a big role in the first day. Um, definitely got to continue to get his legs right. I thought Niagara just out-toughed Mammoth. I thought guys like Nwandu, Kwaka Mensa, Cintron, they just out-toughed the Mammoth kids, the, the Mammoth front line especially. And uh, Mammoth kind of just took it to us from a physicality standpoint. One thing I wasn't happy with in this game, Donovan totally... It had the look of the 20, 30 point game for him early. And Dion was out with foul trouble, and Marcus had early foul trouble. I just thought this is the game where you run Donovan totally 30 plus minutes and you see if his scoring can continue and he can kind of keep you close in a game like this, especially when you were missing some of your main guys. And like we said, they did a good job, a much better job on Malik and a good job on D, De- a uh, great job on Dion. And a very good job on Pappas in this one. Thought Donovan totally should have been unleashed full scale in this one. And I'm starting to worry that we're not going to see him unleashed full scale. So one thing uh, at this point in the season where where we can start to worry about, for me, one thing I'm worried about is that when he gets it going, the way he got it going in the beginning of this game, and he still is on the bench and only playing those, you know, in that 17 to 22 minute range. When the guy has it going, you got to let him go. He got the hornbeak hook, as we say. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Mark, you want to do your Manhattan preview, and then we'll do a few fan questions. And if we have time at the end, we'll do a few more questions with Jaden. Sure. So I'll go quick on Manhattan, and then Jaden, if you want to jump in, if I get anything wrong. Because if anybody knows... Manhattan is Jaden's favorite Mac program. <laughs> is it now? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they got the Seton Hall 6'4 transfer junior guard, Anthony Nelson. I mean, this kid, 13 and a half points a game, two and a half assists, 
over three rebounds. He does it all. Mamet had reached out when he transferred. Too bad we didn't land him as he is the quintessential end of the bench, end of rotation power program guard who transfers down and immediately looks special at the low D1 level. Six foot five junior wing Eli Buchanan, over 10 points, six rebounds, athletic wing. He pursues rebounds and loose balls. He epitomizes what Steve Masiello wants in a basketball player in his program. Six foot one junior guard, Samir Stewart, 10 points per game. He's a streak shooter. He can light you up if he's on on that night and can blow a game open. Uh, reminds me kind of the way Colin Stewart would come in a game and if all of a sudden he hit two, three, four threes, it changed the whole dynamic of a game. That's the way Stewart can be. He's inconsistent, but when he's streaky and he's got it going, he can blow a game open. Six foot nine junior center Warren Williams, nine and a half points, seven and a half rebounds, one and a half blocks, arguably the best back to the basket scorer in the league. I actually would have thought by his junior year he would be doing more uh, scoring wise than he is, but we know the way that Steve Masiola runs his rotation and he gets guys in in and out quick and he expects them to give maximum effort for those three to four minute stanzas especially the bigs i think that's why warren williams isn't a 15 point per game score he's a nine and a half point point per game score not due to a lack of talent big time talented uh center x factor for them george mason transfer junior guard combo guard six foot two jason douglas stanley kid averages seven and a half points per game but he shoots the ball really poorly and has his entire collegiate career career whether it be in george mason where he was 17 percent from the field 25 percent from the field and now i think 27 percent from the field in manhattan this year so far but he contributes a little bit everywhere for the jaspers and if we know one thing about steve masiello it's that any guy who gives superior effort can be effective and can beat you in a game for him Jaden. Absolutely on that. And Elijah Buchanan has really made a big jump with Anthony Nelson. I think those two have changed the game for Manhattan in terms of playing a little more offensively gifted. The inconsistency is still there, though. And that's one thing that if I'm Monmouth, I look to get Manhattan uncomfortable defensively. Last week against St. Peter's, this past weekend, St. Peter's was pressuring Manhattan and it got the Jaspers uncomfortable. Anthony Nelson was six for 29 in those wow. two games against St. Peter's and three for 20 in game two on Saturday when St. Peter's won by 14. When the Jaspers can't shoot, they're prone to get to go on long scoring droughts. And that's the opportunity that Monmouth needs. And it's a two point game could turn into a 22 point game in a matter of about five minutes. Manhattan's still a work in progress. Warren Williams has stayed out of foul trouble a little more than, I thought he would this year. Credit to him and credit to their coaching staff. Samba Diallo is the difference maker for me. He hasn't done as much as I thought he would so far this season. He needs to be that third score, that third or fourth scorer alongside Williams, Nelson, and EB, and even Stewart when he's going off. And he had a good game against St. Peter's on Saturday. If Diallo can space the floor at the four and, and be more like the Calvin Crawford, Zane Waterman type, Manhattan is a much better and more explosive team on the floor. Well, let's hope he doesn't figure it out this weekend. Please. Please. (laughs) All right, let's get into some fan questions. we got like 15, 16 minutes left. Um, So let's start with Tom on Facebook. What do you guys think is going on with Jarvis? I really thought he would be a big part of this team this season, but he just hasn't had much run lately, and he appears to be healthy. Um, He's still getting back. You know, last weekend was the first time he's been back in uniform. It seems like he's been getting one game a weekend so far. Um, He's still working his way back. I mean, I have very high hopes for Jarvis. I think he's a monster under the in the paint and other boards um, under the boards once he gets going. Uh, He's a big piece for this team competing in the net. You know, when they go up against guys like Stormo up at Siena and the Bigs up at Iona, we're going to need Jarvis's physicality down low. And, you know, I am a little concerned, but hopefully this weekend he gets some more minutes, gets back in the court and gets a better feel for the game again. Um, Yeah, it's it's a little concerning, but um, I think he's still working his way back. You guys want to chime in real quick? Yeah, so for me, um, I see the coaching staff trying to play Jarvis at the four a lot. And I think the way to utilize his talents, his versatility, 
his size, his speed, his athleticism, is to throw him in there at the five a bit more. Um, that's what I'd like to see. And again, the kid has to have more consistency when he has the opportunities. But his upside is so high. Um, you know, I, I would like to see him get some run at the five. I know it's been tough because Vuga had some some nice minutes in the beginning of the year. Foster's had uh, some really nice uh, minutes throughout the year. And then Ruddy gave you great minutes the other day. But uh, I'd like to see Jarvis play some five. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joseph on Facebook. Guys, with the likelihood of losing a, uh, of losing a solid core four of seniors, who do you see as possible candidates to fill some very big shoes? Um, so, yeah, I mean, if all four guys leave, I mean, part of it becomes a Donovan Totley show a little bit. Um, you know, you're going to have to depend on guys like Gob Gabriel, um, Jarvis Vaughn, and Kato. Um, we don't have all of our freshmen signed yet, so there's still more recruiting news to come. But it, it's going to be very tough. And next year, you know, if guys like Vaughn and Gob uh, can take those bigger steps, this team still could be a contender. But that's a big if. Those guys got to step up. Um, otherwise, it's totally shown. You can't do it with one guy. I'm hoping at least two of them come back. We have no idea what's who's going to do what, who's got a job lined up, an internship in their field, who wants to play overseas. We have no idea what's coming. It's going to be a very interesting situation. Um, but in the end, I mean, the guys you see on the roster right now, really Gob, totally and Vaughn to me and, and Ruddy in his senior year, those guys got to step up. What do you think, Jaden? I'll jump in on that, and I'll give you a name that neither of you have mentioned. That's Miles Ruth. I think even yeah. if all four of them leave, you look at Miles Ruth playing alongside Totley and allowing Donovan to play more off the ball. We're looking mm -hmm. at a Jesse Steele, Deion Nesmith type backcourt. And yeah. in a transitional year for Monmouth, that can make all the difference in the world in keeping him in the top half of the conference. We've already seen what Ruth can do this season. He's a starting point guard as a freshman. That's only going to help him next year. I, I really think he's going to make a big difference on this team next year and the, and the two after that. Can't disagree with that. Uh, yeah, and again, I'm holding out hope that McClary comes back for the master's degree, Malik Martin comes back since he's a young senior, and George comes back to finish up uh, his fifth year where one of his years he was, uh, I believe his freshman year, he missed a ton of time um, just to get all that time. And we know Mammoth right now only has one commitment in Neptune point guard junior Sam Fagan. So uh, I think it's a foregone conclusion. Dion Hammond's going to be leaving and you know, pursuing professional uh, basketball aspirations. But I think we got a good shot at those other three. And again, kudos to Jaden Daly's guy, Jared Grasso up at Bryant. He's the only, the only coach that I've heard come out and speak about his, uh, his uh, seniors' plans on whether they're going to return or not. And one of them is Peter Kiss, who's been in, in oh. college basketball for episodes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I actually and saw guy, Jared. Another guy I liked. Another guy I would have liked at Monmouth, without a doubt. I, I actually saw Jared Grasso on a list of uh, mid-major coaches most likely to be recruited by high majors this offseason. So Grasso got some recognition. I'm not sure if it was ESPN or CBS. Somebody had an article out, and Grasso was right in the middle of it, so good for him. Um, so Kathleen on Facebook has a few star. questions. I'm going to condense them a little bit. Um, he's asking about Chapu taking a little bit of a step back this year, some of his decision-making. We've talked about Sam Chapu a lot on here. Um, he's definitely taking a little bit of a step back. Um, I think since the beginning of the season, he's improved a lot. I think playing off the bench has been great for him. I, um, I praise King Wrights for making that move after a few weeks and putting Ruth in the game. I think Chapu has done a really good job as a distributor, as a traditional point guard. His scoring isn't there yet, um, even what it was his freshman and sophomore year, but hopefully with more minutes off the bench, that'll keep coming. Um, was... Uh, the absence of Ruddy that critical, or did they just lose focus on Saturday? We kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, I, I think losing Ruddy for that game was big, but I don't think Mom was winning that game whether they had him or not. I think in the end, they just didn't play a great game. Dion was in foul trouble. I think Ruddy would have helped, but I still don't think we were winning that game either way. Um, and something we've talked a lot about here, the timeout. Uh, seems like King is calling timeouts quicker and more frequently than in prior seasons, not letting teams go on long runs. Well, 
you listen, there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there, mainly the two of us, maybe three of us sometimes, that no, you know, people, <laughs> people within the program maybe listen to the podcast and have taken our suggestions here and there because things have mysteriously happened. After a podcast happens, I will say, I said, Miles Roof starting lineup, next game, he's in the starting lineup. So I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but it does seem like King Rice – has been better about timeouts this year. I don't see teams going on these huge runs and him not calling a timeout. It seems actually like they've responded better. They haven't given up those big runs. They've kind of responded on their own, so he hasn't had to. Um, but I would agree, Kathleen. I do think um, King's timeout usage has been a little bit better this year. But want to chime in, guys? <laughs> I'm going to take the fifth on this one. I'm at um, – <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in on on actually the the middle question about did the team lose focus? What was it that they lost in the back to back? So just so everyone knows, and I've already had to apologize to uh, Mr. Flanagan and a couple other people on Facebook when I wasn't live for some of the games this year. I've been blessed with an opportunity to uh, coach freshman boys high school basketball, and with COVID. We're in pods, and with the pods, you play a team from your pod in back-to-back -back games. So we have like a game, a day in between. So like a Monday, Wednesday, a Tuesday, Thursday. So here I am last week. I get to coach, and I know I'm going off on a little bit of a, a little bit of a tangent, but it really does tie into this. So I got to coach my first game. We win at home by 21 points, but then I have one day of practice, and then I have to coach at the away team. Uh, as the away team at that same team. And I have to, and we get into the game in the first half, we're tied or up up two at the end of the first half because that coach and his players made so many, um, excuse me, so many changes to their game plan. So then I had to take my team out into the hallway at, at, uh, at the opposing high school and come up with, my changes and 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 uh and it's just it's so much to play and luckily my changes worked in the second half and we we came away with an eight point win on the road and i told my kids on the bus ride home you never apologize for stealing one on the road and um i i just say like i know that the level that i'm at is such a uh, a lower level than the d1 mac level but there's so many parallels between to play the same team within a 24 48 hour period again and um, that game planning and strategy that it's really hard to get on these guys if if Greg Paulus and his guys took it personally came out with you know a stronger effort and he came out with some different X's and O's and his strategy worked the second the second time the nice thing about the Mac tournament is you don't have to play the same team twice so last one guy guy Falatika on Twitter What's it like to have your team actually play games? <laughs> oh. I think that was a little sarcastic, but oh. Poor I, oh my God, poor Iona right now. I never thought I would say in my life, poor Iona, but I am. Um, yeah, what they're going through right now is just brutal. Um, you know, we were almost a victim again for the fourth time a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah. We had a false positive here at Monmouth. Um, but yeah, I mean, anybody can be taken at any point into the COVID protocols. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely unsettling. And I, I do feel bad for Patino, for Patino and their program. You don't want to see anybody get sick, even your fiercest rivals. Um, you hope everybody's okay there and recovering from whatever they got. Um, but, yeah, that, that's a crappy situation up by, at Iona, Canisius. The team's dealing with that. Um, definitely feel for you, Guy. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping you guys get back on the court soon. Um, and I'll say it again, uh, and I'll let Jaden hear me as well. Guy has made it so much harder to hate Iona. Yes. I hate Iona fans because he is such a good dude. And um, I do feel for him. Uh, he's putting so much into his podcast and into his coverage and into his fandom and, and not getting enough back with, you know, getting to enjoy college basketball and the Iona Gales. And I know what it's like because I remember the beginning of this college basketball season in Monmouth didn't start the same time everybody else tipped off. And it just, it really didn't feel to me like college basketball had officially started until we got to see Mammoth Hofstra. So I totally can uh, relate uh, with what Guy's going through. And uh, we just wish him 
And as, as, as weird as it seems, we wish the Iona program some health and some luck to get those kids and, and everybody back up and back on the floor so that they can enjoy some basketball and lose some games. Yeah, guy's awesome. I've been on his podcast a couple times, and I was actually supposed to do. I was actually supposed to do his, and then this week, and then I own a Manhattan got rescheduled because Patino wasn't ready to return to play with with a full complement of players yet. So that return appearance will have to wait another day. So upcoming schedule for Mom as of now, because whether things change or not, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, at Manhattan. Home versus Fairfield at Iona and at Ryder. Um, so you look at the max standings right now. Monmouth is on top with Sienna. Sienna's eight and two. Monmouth eight and four. Um, so Jaden, from what you're seeing around the MAC, is this essentially a four-team race with uh, Sienna, Iona, Monmouth, and St. Peter's, or is there another team in the mix that you think can legitimately contend and win this thing down in AC, like actually win it? I don't want to put Iona in that group yet because four games isn't enough of a sample size, and the four MAC games were against Fairfield and Ryder, so Iona hasn't sure. played the top of the conference yet. But I do think Sienna, Monmouth, and St. Peter's are the top three, and right now if I had to put a fourth team in there, it would probably be either Manhattan or Marist, and I'd lean more toward Marist. When you look at what John Dunn has been able to pull off this season with two freshman guards in Hakeem Bird and Ricardo Wright, both of them will be on the old rookie team. And Raheem Sullivan, the junior college transfer from Canada, replacing Tyler Sagal. And Michael Cubbage going down with a broken foot and missing the whole season. Jordan Jones has been an efficient big man. I think Maris could get in, could win a, t- a tournament game and get to the semifinals for the first time in 14 years. And then on top of that, you never count John Dunn out. You guys, you guys sure. know all too well from what happened a few years ago when Nick Griffin stole one from the the first round. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jaden, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. How many conference wins is it going to take to get first place for the MAC regular season? I'll say 13 or 14. I think it'll be a lot, a lot like last year. Oceana won 15 last year, but I think 13 or 14 pulls it off this season. When you look at some teams that have yet to play each other, and mm-hmm. the matchups that, that are still to be determined, 13 or 14 probably pulls it off. Now, I have a question for you, Mark. Are you mm-hmm. coaching Friday and Saturday? Uh, Saturday morning. Uh, Friday, I have an earlier game. So, luckily, uh, Manhattan's playing at 9 p.m. So, I'm good to watch lots and lots of basketball this weekend. Good. So, my game threads will have active participation this weekend. <laughs> I'm all for that. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. I got to juggle two press conferences this weekend, too, because Manhattan's home, so I'm going to do something with Mass wow. Yellow, and then nice. I'll still have questions for Kane if worse comes to us. I'll put them in the Zoom chat. Awesome. Um, so my next question is, are we worried about what happens in Atlantic City if a Tier 1 member, which is basically the coaching staff, the players, the trainer, um, what if somebody tests positive and, or has symptoms? Is that team forfeiting a game? Are we rescheduling within the week? Um, you know, my, my hope is that teams are quarantining that week before they go up there. And then pretty much you're in your hotel room if you're not at practice or a game. So I'm, I don't know, Gene, I know you're a little more inside the Mac with Enzer, which, you know, speaking of that, I actually want to try to see if these upcoming weeks, we can try to get Rich Enzer on the podcast. We, we, we talked about that earlier in the year. I, I kind of want to see if we can make that happen soon. Um, but are we kind of concerned about what happens if somebody – test positive in there. Well, Rich Enzer mentioned that on the MAC conference call last week, and it's still something that's being worked out. There's no definitive concrete answer right now, but it, it is something that's, that's being worked on. All right, fair enough. Um, so, uh, let's see, what do we want to do here? Um, last question. So, how do you think Patina and Iona are dealing with this where like what kind of effect is this going to have on their team? Because there's so many games to make up and they probably won't make up all of them. There's just not enough time, but they could either be really defeated and just never get the mesh together. Or if they find their rhythm under Patino and his system and they're forced to play, you know, 10 games over a few weeks, you know, it's going to be really interesting. So what, how do you think Iona fares in the end? 
with all this time off? It depends on the matchups. I think I think they come back and probably split the first couple of games. And then if they get hot, then you run the risk of fatigue going into the MAC tournament and, and really having to play so many games in such a short period of time. I worry about Iona getting picked off in the first round. So I, I do think they'll split the first couple and it, they'll be maybe five and three, six and three around around the midpoint. And then coming into the second half, I'm worried about them hitting the wall. I really am. And and, and how could Rick Pitino uh, sell to those kids like, oh, no, Isaiah Ross, like we need you to sit this game or, you know, Asante Gist, we need you to limit your minutes down the stretch when those kids have barely gotten to play this year. So sure. I feel like mm-hmm. I, I definitely feel like Iona – if Patino, first of all, is going to want them to play as many games as they can for the kids to have the experience. Second of all, he wants to win as many games as he can for the seeding in down in Atlantic City. But then third of all, those kids are going to want to have the experience of playing and the game film if they want to, you know, try to play professionally um, in the future next year, especially Ross and Gist. Um, I, I could see a situation where they put so much into – trying to make up for lost time uh, to, to grab a cliche with their performances there that they roll into Atlantic city with tired legs. I can definitely see that. And right. I have a question for you, Jaden, with this being such a difficult year for Rick Pitino, we already knew it was going to be somewhat of a, a culture shock for him to be coaching at a, a small college uh, at like Iona. Could this stress of this year and the way things have gone, do you think it could send him into retirement or send him looking for greener pastures of back to the Euro League or possibly grabbing one of the power conference uh, jobs that come available? I don't think so. I think he's looking at this season as a missed opportunity and he'll still have and he'll have an even bigger chip on his shoulder next season with something more to prove at Iona. I, I think he's in it for at least a couple more years. He says he wants to honor his contract, which means he's got four more left after that. Great. I do. I do think. <laughs> I do. I do think. I do think he comes back motiv- motivated more than this year, next season with this group, and especially with his younger talent and what what they've put up in in a limited sample size. I do think he's here for at least another year or two. Ugh. Hey, uh, Ryan. Can I ask him one more while we got him? Yeah, real quick. Go ahead. One more question. What's up, Mark? Why is Jalen Pickett allowed to push off with his Uh. arm every single time up and down the court? (laughs) And it's not a fair whistle for everyone else in the MAC. And the MAC continues to sensationalize him as, uh, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable. They, They treat this kid like he's on a different level than everyone else, both with the praise that he gets from opposing coaches to the press that he gets to even the way he's officiated. Um, how, can I, how can I get that message sent to someone before Atlantic City hits? I knew he was going to ask this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm not a Mac official, so I, I can't call from experience. If you would, you wouldn't be on the show. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I guess you take the good with the bad. But I can, t- I can tell you this. Shalen Pickett is probably the most favored player in this conference since Billy Barron at Canisius. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's even close. He's getting calls that AJ English didn't get. He's yep. getting calls that Justin didn't get. Justin never He's, got those calls. Nope. Oh, I know. He's getting calls that Ramel Brown never got at Manhattan. Yep. He's getting calls that Cam Young didn't get at Quinnipiac. Sure. He won player of the year. Isaiah Reese mm-hmm. before he left Canisius. J- Jalen Pickett is a, is a talented player. Don't get me wrong. Honestly, if, if I had a Mac player of the year vote right now, I wouldn't even give it to him. I'd give it to Manny Camper, but that's another issue for another day. So our next orders of business um, for the podcast, we're going to be trying to get Rich Enzer on, which would be a huge get for us. So, Jaden, I'll be talking to you about that in the next couple of weeks. Um, okay. And also, we're working on getting a Mac roundtable together before the Mac tournament. Um, so I know we got the three of us. Uh, I know we got Guy Faltico. So Guy will do it. At, I'm also looking at a few other people to see if any of the other teams have people we want. We can do a big Zoom or Skype call um, and, you know, put it on everybody's podcast or whatever they do. Um, so I'm looking into that and seeing how many people we can get for that, have a nice discussion and kind of preview the MAC tournament. Um, I'll reach out to Chris Williams. I'll see if he wants to do it. 
Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. So uh, that's going to wrap it up for tonight. Uh, Jay, and thanks a lot for coming on. We really appreciate it, man. Not a problem, guys. Always a pleasure. Always love talking with you guys. Thanks so, so much, Jaden. That's going to do it for tonight's show. Uh, Mama Splits Niagara on the road, and we'll visit Manhattan this Friday night, which will be aired on ESPNU at 9 o'clock. Thanks again to Jaden for joining us tonight. Make sure you check out his articles on his website, Daily Dose of Hoops. He's also all over Twitter. Um, very best in the Mac, so don't miss any of his content. Mammoth Nation, please be safe out there. Mask up. He's still going up around here all over the country, and we all need to do our part in keeping ourselves as safe as poss possible, keep each other safe. So please, if you're with anyone not in your household, please, please, please distance and wear a mask so we can get back to watching basketball in person sooner than later. Thank you for listening, and have a great night.